Hello everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar, The Innovation Behind Skin Pin Precision and Why It Matters to Your Practice. Today, we will take a deep dive into the engineering of skin pin precision, the first FDA cleared microneedling device in the world, US engineered and manufactured by Crown Aesthetics. We hope by sharing this information, you are able to perform skin pin procedures on a new level in your clinic, driving both enhanced safety and efficacy for your patients. My name is Angela McDonald, and I am the Senior Director of Education and National Accounts for Crown Aesthetics. I will be moderating today's webinar. Our webinar is scheduled for one hour. Before we begin, let me share a few housekeeping notes. During the webinar, all lines will be muted to avoid any background noise. If you would like to ask a question, you can do so at any time during the presentation by typing your question into the chat box at the bottom right of your screen. We will conduct the Q&A at the end of Dr. Hitchcock's presentation. For those of you today who are viewing this webinar on a computer, you should see both a full screen slide presentation and at the same time, a thumbnail view of Dr. Hitchcock presenting in front of a screen once we get started. You should have the ability to go full screen with either view and toggle between the two as you see fit. Please note there are portions of this presentation that do contain video. To properly view the video, you will want to go full screen with the slide presentation. For those of you today who are viewing on a cell phone, you will see either Dr. Hitchcock presenting or the slide presentation once we get started. To toggle between the two, simply swipe right. You will also want to ensure you are on the slide presentation screen at the time of the videos in the latter portion of the present presentation. So let's get started. We are thrilled today to present Dr. Thomas Hitchcock, Chief Science Officer of Crown Laboratories. Dr. Hitchcock is a formally trained geneticist and tissue engineer, holding a PhD in molecular genetics from Clemson University. Dr. Hitchcock completed his postdoctoral training in tissue engineering and regenerative medicine at Duke University and vascular biology and therapeutics at Yale University where he was involved in groundbreaking research and development of engineered human cardiovascular and pulmonary tissues. Dr. Hitchcock has more than 15 years of research experience across several therapeutic areas, including cardiology, oncology, gene therapy, plastic facial plastic surgery, dermatology, and aesthetic medicine. Most notably for us, Dr. Hitchcock has been an integral part of the Crown Aesthetics, formerly Bellis Medical Team, leading our clinical and medical fairs since the launch of SkinPen in 2013. To be led by a scientist of Dr. Hitchcock's caliber is one of the many differentiating factors of our organization, which ultimately has led to our success in becoming not only the first FDA cleared microneedling device in the world, but also currently the number one microneedling technology in the US. Dr. Hitchcock has overseen the advancement of SkinPen and its related protocols and education through four device generations, most notab notably the development of skin pin precision, which you will learn more about today. Dr. Hitchcock. Hello, everyone. I'm gonna get my video up here for you. Thank you, Angela. I appreciate the intro and thank you all for taking your time today to listen to my thoughts on the innovation that went behind the engineering of the skin pen precision device. If you're listening to this right now, then you've probably been given some speaking points about the quality um, or the degree of work and validation that went into the skin pen precision to make it the world's first uh, device of its kind that the FDA cleared as safe and effective. However, I thought it would be more interesting to show you, to show you, uh, not just tell you about the quality design and engineering behind the device. Um, what we're gonna discuss today and show you today is some of the concept work, the proof of concept work, I'm sorry, that the, our scientists and collaborators have done uh, that makes the concepts a little more tangible for those of you who might have find some of these uh, ideas a little more nebulous. So in this two-part series, we'll be looking at different design elements of the precision device and show you some of the physical evidence that we've designed uh, uh, of why we designed the, the device the way that we did. Now, uh, I want to reiterate that this is a encore presentation. Uh, we've done this before, so uh, I wanna make clear that this is not part two because we're planning to do a two-part series uh, and uh, this is the first of that two-part series. During that, uh, during today's series, we're gonna talk about the design elements that went into the disposable portion of the device, uh, the advantage, uh, advanced cartridge unit. Uh, next 
portion, we'll talk about the more on the uh, actual um, handheld portion of the device. So uh, as Angela mentioned, I have the slides behind me here. I'm gonna try and face forward because uh, I was told that you cannot hear me properly when I turn around to point. So I'll try to do a weatherman thing and point this way. Uh, however, also remember that you can look at the slides uh, close up if you need to by toggling. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, I'll go ahead and begin. Okay, so uh, if you see this chart here, you'll probably, uh, if, you, if you already have a precision device or you've talked to any of the salespeople at Crown Aesthetics, you've probably seen this, this type of slide where we're looking at the different validation studies that were done to get the clearance through the FDA and other regulatory bodies. Um, while we do like to make mention of this because we are very proud of this work, sometimes these things are a little nebulous. So people look at it and they say, okay, needle, very, uh, needle durability, what does that mean? How did you test for that? And you know, what, what, do, what, what can I look for to look for needle durability? The reciprocating motion. Um, so it says here, the purpose was to verify the needle reciprocating motion meets safety specifications. Okay, well, what does that mean? How does that translate to benefit for my practice? How is it different from other devices that are on the market? Needle penetration depth. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, all the devices on the market basically say that you can dial them up or dial them down to specific depths. And so how is that different from uh, the skin pen precision? Why is it that we are talking about that as a validation study? And uh, what does that mean to my practice? Uh, on this next slide here, you can see that there's three more here that we uh, will be looking at today, which is the fluid ingress protect prevention. And so that is one of those things that uh, is one of the top priorities for most practices, which is how do I know that when I'm doing a microneedling uh, procedure that I'm not getting any of the fluid from uh, the contact of the patient, like blood or lymph or, or plasma uh, sucked into the device and uh, so that I don't have to feel like if I don't actually clean it from, from use to use, uh, I'm gonna potentially cause cross-contamination. Cross um, while there is, and then the Santa Claus wiping cleaning validation. So basically these are three steps to ensure that your device is always sterile. But the key point is that if the first step, the fluid ingress prevention actually works properly, then you wouldn't have to take additional steps. Uh, but uh, some of you are more cautious than others. So there are three ways to basically mitigate any possible risk. Uh, and that is by um, using a, a, a certain disinfectant to actually wipe down the device, the bow sheet to prevent any contact even indirectly uh, with bodily fluids and then the fluids ingress pre prevention. Now, uh, there are quite a few companies that basically take these same speaking points. However, we wanna go, we have always gone the step further and we actually will show you how we've done this. So this again is something that you can find in any of our marketing literature. Uh, this, is a, this is not, I, I'm not gonna belabor this point, but this looks to the needle durability. This, uh, basically is looking at one of the smallest components of the needling device, the needle itself, the micro needle itself, and showing that there are differences, that just because a device claims that it has micro needles does not mean that they are all the same, even down to the smallest component. So here you can see on the uh, left-hand side here, the skin pen needle. So these are our needles that we quality control to be all the same, uh, we make sure that they're uh, completely straight, that there's no uh, imperfections that would lead to any type of ten, uh, tearing uh, or, or um, uh, anything of that nature. In the middle and then on the right-hand side here, you can see two other companies' devices, uh, not our device. And these are devices on the market that you can see there are some irregular, either irregularities or the needles themselves aren't truly needles, but actually serrated blades. And so <clears throat> we need to just keep in mind that even the smallest components, just because somebody uses the moniker microneedling does not mean that all of these devices are the same. Uh, here you can see it's not even just the needles themselves, but it is the way that the needles are actually inserted into the device. Uh, this particular example uh, is not our device again, but uh, it is a device that you can see that most of the needles are uh, placed at the appropriate depth or the same consistent depth, but there's one needle right in the middle that is actually significantly higher than the rest. And so I'm not sure if this was intentional by that device, but when you are actually trying to do a prescriptive type of treatment where you're looking to hit certain depth of tissue, 
um, it, you got to remember these are going hundreds of reciprocations per second, and so therefore that one uh, needle will be producing hundreds to thousands of channels at that depth, where the other needles will be producing channels at a different depth. So this is just something to say that again, even the smallest components, but not just the smallest components, but the way that their quality, the, the quality control for actually putting those components together, truly matter. Okay, so this slide here is a uh, is an image of the patent that we have been issued. Um, so the the skin pen precision is a patented device, and this schematic here on the left or the right hand side here is actually a representation of the disposable cartridge, the advanced cartridge unit, and this is actually the part that is uh, patented. So the reason why it's so different and we were able to receive this patent is because we actually did something that was quite unique and we took the reciprocating mechanism and we'll talk about what that is, how that's put together, et cetera. We moved it from the hand unit and we placed it into the disposable part. Now there's a few reasons that we, we, we do that. One is so that, because the, uh, the reciprocating mechanism is the one that has the most moving parts, and the most delicate parts. So this way you basically have a new fresh device every time you do a procedure. But that's just the beginning of why we did that. There's other reasons as well. And we'll, we'll talk about that in the next few slides. So if you look at the next, partic particularly the next slide here, we have a skin pen advanced cartridge unit. And here's one in my hand right here. Uh, we basically broke it into pieces. So we, we took it apart and we uh, put each of the pieces and the components here on the top uh, left-hand side. And you can see this is a scotch yoke mechanism. So basically what a scotch yoke mechanism is meant to do is to uh, turn a rotational uh, motion into linear motion. So the uh, areas that are populating here, I'll go ahead and populate them all until this animation. Uh, so basically what we can see here is that you, you, there's a rotate. Now this is, the animation here is not uh, uh, our device. It's basically a representation of the type of mechanism that turns that rotational motion into linear motion, which is what ours does on a, a smaller scale. So you can see we have this, uh, this, the, uh, the crank, which is the rotational mechanism. And you can see that little gray dot in the middle of the uh, crank is a pin that actually is slightly offset so that every time it turns, there's a slotted link that is connected to the, uh, the pistons and uh, the piston plate, which has the needles in it. And that actually allows it to turn into uh, linear motion. That slot actually, because of the offset of the needle, uh, as it rotates, slides along the slot and the slotted yoke. And then that actually converts it to linear uh, motion. And so if you go a little further, you can see uh, the animation, or I'm sorry, the video here, of the skin pen so let's go there you can see the skin pen actually in motion if you look really closely at the middle there we've actually did a cross section here so in a normal device you would not be able to see this but uh, if you look closely in the middle there you can see the actual scotch yoke mechanism working now why is this important because other devices may use a similar mechanism but the the point is that they actually have that mechanism inside the uh, hand piece and not the disposable part and that's a very important consideration that we, we looked at when we were designing this pen, because what we have here is actually a coupled mechanism. So all of the rotational energy that goes in to making it linear all happens in the, hand, the uh, disposable itself. So it's all coupled. That means that every rotation, the same force is pushing the needles into the skin as is the force taking it back out of the skin. <clears throat> So if you look at the next slide here, I have a schematic that I drew myself to demonstrate this. So if you look on the left-hand side here, this is an example of coupled retraction, and this is what the skin pen precision has, and this is what's unique, because ours is the only device that I'm aware of on the market that actually has this type of reciprocating mechanism where it's coupled. And that means that at, for every turn, and as you can see the circle on the bottom, the little oval, uh, that's the representation of the crank. And that is in the disposable portion. So the motor turns the crank, and the crank actually causes the linear motion through the shaft there that is attached to the needles. And so the force of the crank actually translates directly to the force of the shaft here. Uh, on the return, which is represented by the red arrows, on the return of that mechanism, you see that it's the same force uh, from the same crank 
and it's the same force pulling the needles back out of the skin. Because of this, you actually have the, uh, on each reciprocation, you're gonna have the same force pushing the needles in and pulling them back out. So every time it's gonna be calibrated correctly to uh, penetrate the skin at the depth that is dialed into the needle setting, the setting that is dialed into the needle. Now, we're gonna look at some proof that shows that in a bit. But, so this is really the theoretical portion of our discussion, and then we'll show you the actual hands-on portion that will give you a little more sense as to uh, the proof of concept. So if you look at the, the right-hand side here, this is the majority of other devices. And so this was actually the same mechanism that we used in previous iterations of the skin pen device and that we've moved away from intentionally, and I'll tell you why in a second. So if you look at the right-hand side here, you can see that they have also a scotch yoke mechanism. The difference here is that the actual uh, part where the piston is connected to the needles is uncoupled. And what that means is that the part, the crank is connected to a piston just like with uh, our device, the skin pen precision. But the difference is that now you have a disconnection between the cartridge where you have a needle head that is connected to a piston that is disconnect, disconnected to the piston in the device. So as the crank uh, rotates, the force of the piston pushes up and then pushes the uh, piston in the uh, cartridge up as well with the same force. The difference now is that the way that it's pulling back is not through a direct retraction, meaning it's not coupled. So the piston in the device pulls back, as you can see in the middle part of that uh, schematic, but the pulling back from the needle head is actually done through springs or rubber or some sort of spring-like mechanism. That's why we're calling it a spring-modulated retraction. So the uh, force is going to be different. So unless the force is exactly the same from the spring as the motor, then you're gonna have a phenomenon that, uh, that causes a difference in cadence. So what that means is that the motor will be going at one speed, but the speed of the retraction and insertion is gonna be of the needle head itself in these uncoupled devices will be a product, a combination of the speed of the motor pushing in and, and the force and speed of the, of the spring pulling back. And so because it's unlikely that the force is equal between the spring and the motor itself, you're gonna have an incomplete or an irregular retraction. Now, if you're trying, to, some devices may try to fix that by actually making the force of the spring higher so that it's pulling back with great force in order to make sure that any time the piston pulls back, the spring also pulls back uh, at the same cadence. But the problem with that is, is that it's tricky because if you don't get the spring to be exactly the right force, then basically you're gonna actually make the motor push harder and you're gonna end up with an incomplete insertion. So even though you, you try to put your uh, device to go to a certain depth, it's always gonna be off slightly with calibration. Now, also the other component of this is that springs uh, and rubber and such with re repeated uh, uh, um, use of that mechanism can lose its elastic properties. So you have to make sure you're using a very high quality, either metal or rubber in order to make sure that the retraction force is consistent throughout the entire use of that particular disposable. And so the, there's a lot of considerations and variables when you're using an uncoupled mechanism. And that's one of the main reasons why uh, we engineered the skin pen precision to use a coupled mechanism. It takes those variables out of commission, out of, out of the equation. And so if you look at the next uh, slide here, what we did, as we, uh, this is the first part of our show and tell, is that we actually took several devices. And right here we have three of them. Um, our device is on the most uh, left-hand side. And then we have brand Y in the middle and brand Z on the other end. So, if we, uh, Angela, if you go ahead and play the um, video here. Okay, so we did it. We did it at higher speed. Now it's in slow motion. So this is very much slowed down, so we can capture the reciprocations. And what you can see here is this is a device that uses a rubber spring, or, or it's an uncoupled retraction. And so you can see that what's happening is you're getting a bit of a, a cadence of where it's not completely retracting the needles. So you can see a couple of insertions where it's not retracting completely. Let's see if we can uh, start it again. Okay, slow. So basically, there you go. So you can see where it's got a couple of cadences where it's not retracting completely and then it retracts completely. 
and a couple of cadence where it's not retracting completely and then it's retracting completely. And so we have an inconsistency of the retractions. Now, this particular device will look at the uh, depth of penetration as well later, and you'll see that also there's issues with the consistency of penetration based on the calibration of where we're trying, the depth we're trying to achieve. But if we look at the middle device here, we'll see that this particular device has a, a different uh, type of uh, uh, issue. So this particular spring uh, coupled uh, retraction actually doesn't even fully retract. So it's got a pretty consistent cadence, but the, but the uh, problem is that, uh, can you go ahead and play it again, please? The problem is that it's not able to fully retract. So as you can see, the needles are going to be constantly in the skin. So if you drag that across the skin, you're going to end up causing further injuries and tears. So if you look at the skin pen precision, we did the same thing here, and you can see that with a coupled retraction, you're able to get a full, a complete retraction every time. And so that is actually a uh, proof of concept type of uh, uh, set of videos here to show you that the difference between the spring modulated retraction and the coupled, retra coupled retraction is quite significant when you're looking at the quality of the device and what you're trying to achieve. So on some of them, for instance, brand Z, you may not uh, worry as much because there is gonna be complete retraction, it's just gonna be inconsistent. Where with brand Y, uh, and we'll describe it a little bit later, uh, you actually see that you're not even getting any complete retractions or the skin pen, you're always getting complete retractions. So if you go to the next slide here, you can see uh, what we decided to do is look at the depth of penetration. Now, uh, this is a study that we did in collaboration with the University of Texas Arlington, and so it was in the um, uh, it was in the lab of Dr. Ki Tai uh, Nguyen, and uh, her uh, graduate students also assisted with this as well, her postdoc and graduate students, and then um, some of our scientists as well as uh, Dr. Brian Jones, who heads up our medical affairs and, and clinical ops group, he uh, participated in this as well. And so this was kind of driven by a publication in 2017 where uh, Dr. Gordon Sasaki, and I won't talk about the actual devices that were, were, talk, were, were uh, measured in this particular study, but this is in uh, the journal article as uh, cited on the bottom right-hand side here, so you can look it up yourself if you're interested. Uh, but he looked at a particular device, uh, and Gordon uh, does really great work. Uh, Dr. Sasaki, I always enjoy his publications. He does uh, very thorough studies usually. And so you can see here that he dialed the device to specific lengths starting at 0 0.25 uh, millimeters up to 2.5 millimeters. And this particular device, not the skin pen precision, but this particular device, as you can see, when he measured the depths of his microchannels that were created, they were pretty consistent up to about a millimeter. And then at a millimeter, you see that there's really not a significant change. Uh, on average, they're still at about a millimeter to a millimeter and a quarter, even if you go up to uh, upwards of two and a half millimeters. So there's an inconsistency, and some of that is probably uh, attributed to the actual mechanism by which the motor translates the energy into linear motion. So we decided with the University of Texas Arlington to go, have, go ahead and set up some apparatus so that we could measure using uh, skin substitutes uh, how deep the actual uh, needles penetrated in this gel that is a, is a tissue substitute. And so you can see here on the left-hand side, they made sure that the gel was homogenous so that uh, every time you're looking at it, you're gonna see uh, the true uh, measure of the depth of the penetration of the needles. And then on the right-hand side here, that's how we were setting up uh, all of these devices through a mechanism that allowed us to make sure that it, there's no human error introduced here as far as the amount of pressure, et cetera. So they were all lower to the surface of the gel substitute, and then uh, they were ran, and we measured the uh, depth of the penetration looking at it through uh, dyes that were entered into uh, the gel. As you can see here, um, we, we actually, this is the measurement of the skin pen precision, the results, so we ran it in triplicate. And you can see basically, we'll just go to the next slide here, which is the graphical representation, or the, the, uh, yeah, the graphical representation here. And you can see that it pretty much measured up. So when you dialed it to half a millimeter, you got half a millimeter, uh, give or take a small uh, variation. Um, the one millimeter seemed to be a little more variable there, but uh, uh, on average it was around one millimeter. And you, uh, you can, uh, again and again, up to a two and, uh, and a quarter millimeter, they measured, uh, it was the final measurement here. 
and you can see they all tracked pretty close with very, very tight vari uh, uh, variation. So the standard deviation was not much uh, for most of these measurements. However, what we decided to do was then compare to other devices because we wanted to see, okay, well, our device, you know, stacks up pretty well. Uh, we, we, we know that when we measure it, we dial to a certain uh, needle depth, it usually penetrates to that depth. It was validated with the FDA. And here we're showing you today that independently when we, ve when we do uh, measurements through a third party, we see again that the measurements do penetrate to where we dial on. So here we, uh, we looked at all these devices and we measured them to around, uh, we set them to their de uh, the device to around two millimeters. And what we found was the skin pen device, as we saw before, uh, went to about two millimeters, give or take a small variation, as you can see here. Then we went to brand X. Uh, so brand X, we set at two millimeters and we saw uh, after we did five uh, runs of this particular test for this device. And you can see that although we set it at two millimeters, uh, consistently we saw around 1.75 on average uh, millimeters. So it's uh, calibrated about a quarter less millimeter than what uh, we're, we're seeing. Brand Y, uh, when we set to two millimeters, we actually saw uh, that it went to the, about the same, about 1.75 millimeters on average. And then brand Z, uh, interestingly enough, brand Z uh, is uh, only going to about 1.25 on average. So <clears throat> although set upwards of uh, near two millimeters, I believe this, this particular one uh, was actually at 1.9, uh, it was set to, but it actually went to only 1.25 on average. So if you look at comparison of all these devices, uh, you can see that, uh, this is just a direct comparison of the slides I just showed you previously, that uh, brand uh, X, Y, and Z uh, do have a variability from where they are actually set to. So while they have a pretty, uh, you can see brand Z and Y, their standard deviation is about 0.05. And while that's larger than the brand X and skin tone, which is 0.03 and 0.02, um, it's still not that bad as far as the variability of the actual uh, penetrations. However, they are off. Uh, the brand Z, uh, brand Z is uh, the most off from any of the, uh, any other of the devices we tested uh, at about <clears throat> three quarters of a millimeter off from where it was set, uh, where brand Y and brand X were about a quarter of a millimeter off from where it was set and skin pen was hardly, uh, it was not off. Uh, it had a normal variation of less than 10%. So here's a graphical representation of that. Again, um, what the considerations that are interesting here is that uh, the brand X is actually a leading uh, a brand outside the United States. It's not really found in the United States, but it's outside the United States, a leading brand. And it, interestingly enough, uh, brand Y that is comparable to brand X is not a leading brand, but is something that is a, a brand that is something that was found uh, for very cheap on Amazon. Uh, so it was a very low quality device uh, that, uh, uh, well, we're, we're expecting for the price that we bought it that it's low quality simply because of it was under $100. Uh, yet it had a same calibration as brand X, which is a much more expensive leading brand outside the United States. And then brand Z is actually one of the other FDA cleared brands. And as you can see, the calibration was off uh, um, the most of any of the other devices tested. And that's in, and now, of course, we have, uh, I think at this point, four FDA clear devices, and uh, we won't go into actually which device it was, but you can see that even, again, just because something uses the, the moniker of microneedling, just because it has a validation through a uh, regulatory body um, does not mean it necessarily has uh, quality. All right, now we're going to move on to fluid, ingren, uh, uh, fluid ingress protection. So um, basically, when we did our work with the FDA several years ago, um, what we uh, were asked to do by the FDA in order for them to feel comfortable with us uh, moving forward and getting our clearance was to show a, wor a worst case real world scenario. So we actually went above and beyond. So in, in a real world scenario, you're gonna be treating the skin and having fluids on the skin, um, and you're gonna have an array of microbes from the microbiome of your skin. So for instance, we have here Staphylococcus epidermidis. Uh, we have some Bacillus subtilis, uh, which is in a very low portion. We have um, um, Staphylococcus aureus, which is uh, known to be uh, associated with um, pathogenicity. Uh, however, it's also in a very little amount on the skin typically, 
and then uh, E. coli, which can be associated very little with the skin, but mostly can be contamination from uh, the gut as well as uh, contaminated food sources. And so we actually took a soup of these bacteria um, and uh, we put them into high quant quantities. So down at the bottom, you can see that uh, what we did is we actually used a soup where the, there was per milliliter uh, 125 million uh, bacteria per milliliter. So that's, uh, of course, going to be much higher than you would see in an actual treatment. Um, and then also when we did the study, which we're going to show you a video in a little bit, uh, which shows you a technique we look for prevention of fluid ingress. Uh, I'm not going to show you right away, but it's exactly the technique we used where we, we took the soup of bacteria and we ran the skin pen on that soup of bacteria for 45 minutes. Uh, every five minutes, we would turn the uh, skin pen upside down. We would change the setting to the next depth, turn it back right side up, and then we would treat for another five minutes. So it was in five minute increments, turn, switch, and treat again for a consistent 45 minutes. And what we saw was the next slide, well, the next slide is uh, what we uh, did. We actually, after we did that test, we swabbed the inner part of the device. Uh, so the inside the, cu the coupling mechanism and then inside of the, uh, the uh, disposable tip as well with a uh, cotton swab. And then we actually uh, swabbed that onto Petri dishes to show that there was no contamination. Now, the idea is, uh, the, the idea is that when you do that, uh, any one particular bacteria that grows onto that Petri dish will form a colony. So you'll see a little white dot, a little white mound called a colony. And that colony represents one single bacteria that multiplied and became many, many bacteria. And so as you can see here, when we tested before, we saw uh, ND, which means no colonies observed um, on either the pen or the cartridge. So we, we expect that because we, we sanitized the device prior to uh, using it. And then after treatment, <clears throat> you can see here that there was no colonies de detected as well, none detected. So you might say, okay, well, how do we know that this was working? So if we go to the next slide here, which is the positive control. So we took that same soup, we diluted it a thousand times, and the top left-hand corner is when we plated that dilution of a thousand times you, you, is what we would see. We call that a lawn, where you're not able to distinguish the individual colonies. Then you can see we did a serial dilution where we diluted it next 10,000 times, 100,000 times, a million times, and then 10 million times, which is on the far right here. And you can see once we, dil when we diluted it that much, the positive control only shows one colony. So basically, uh, if any bacteria are able to get through the, uh, through the device into the mechanism, uh, even in a real world worst case scenario, we should be able to measure that. So as you can see in the next slide here, this is before, so when we swabbed the device before, we saw that each, each of the cartridges do not have a, um, a colony that is formed. Now, what, what I'll show you is that you can see a little dot uh, on the right-hand bottom uh, Petri dish. That is not a colony. That, those are bubbles that form when you're pouring the auger gel. So, if you, uh, Angela, if you go up a, the, the slide before, you can see a very big difference um, between a true colony, as you can see there, and then if you go back down, to the bubble. So I just want to show you that in case that confused anybody. And then if we go to the next one, uh, we look at the pen where we, we uh, actually uh, sampled each of the pens before we did the test and you can see again nothing uh, on those plates. Uh, then after, which is the next slide, we can see that when we uh, looked at the uh, pens after, the cartridges after, we didn't see not even one colony. And then uh, the pen itself afterwards, we did not see even one colony. Okay, so all of you might say, well, this is great. It convinced the FDA, right? Yeah, so uh, that might be good enough for me. Other of you might say, well, you know what? There's people coming into uh, my practice and they're actually pouring liquid into these different cartridges and showing me that there's uh, fluid flowing out when I'm pouring copious amounts of fluid into these cartridges. So therefore, I'm skeptical. Well, we'll have the answer for you in a second. But before we do that, we're going to look at this three-day experiment that we did with the sheaths. And so <clears throat> another uh, sense of uh, security when we uh, use our devices is making sure that we're, uh, even if we are going to wipe the device down after we use it, we want to make sure that we're not introducing enough to actually get into the nooks and crannies. So one of the other things that we did when we designed our devices, we ultrasonically sealed the handpiece so that if you were touching it even without a sheath on it, 
Um, there's not a lot of nooks and crannies for any bacterial or virus or anything like that to hide. Um, that being said, there's no need to take chances. And also we don't wanna make life harder for everybody. So we, we have the sheath to actually protect the device. And so what we were able to show is that if you look at the sheath here on this next slide, you can see how the sheath is attached to the device. <laughs> and uh, actually, can you go a couple of slides up? You need to go up, there you go. Um, and so you can see that basically when the sheath is attached to the device, uh, that you have this, the, um, the disposable part of the device, and then you also have uh, the sheath covering the non-disposable portion. And so the part, the part that people want to know is that, okay, if I'm using this device uh, and I um, get contaminant, uh, contaminant onto the bio sleeve or the bio sheath or onto the cartridge itself, uh, will I be able to make sure that the device itself is not in contact with that uh, potential pathogen? And so what we did was we took that same soup that we talked about before and we literally sprayed it and poured it on top of the bio sheath and the cartridge. And the next slide here is exactly what we saw. So not what we saw, but this is the positive control again. So this is taking that same soup and, grow, and growing it on Petri dishes to show that uh, what happens when you see uh, 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 a serial dilution of those bacteria. And then after uh, the next slide is before each of the uh, experiments, you can see uh, the first pen, we, we measured the actual middle of the coupler mechanism, the plastic of the actual outside of the actual device, and the inside of the sheath. And so we did that with pen one, two, and then the next slide is pen three. As you can see, there was no contaminant on any of these. Okay, this is not, it's the slide before, so. Okay, so this is pen three. So you can see there's no contamination. And if we go to the next slide, this is actually the outside of the sheaths. So you can see on the outside, there was, there was a whole lot of bacterial contamination, yet inside the sheath, we did not even see one. Um, and so it basically is inhibiting uh, the, even the smallest microbes from getting inside to the actual pen mechanisms. And then here uh, is the metal part of pens after treatments. Uh, this is the um, plastic part of the pen and then the cartridge. So uh, again, let's talk about um, what we discussed earlier about uh, uh, people that have decided they wanted to you know, take it upon themselves to measure uh, whether or not pens can allow for uh, or can mitigate fluid ingress. And so we've had people, there was a, there was a person in uh, the UK that actually decided they wanted to go around testing cartridges uh, by taking that cartridge and pouring liquid into the cartridge and then seeing whether or not it flowed out of the cartridge. Um, now, some devices actually try to mitigate cross-contamination by putting a physical barrier inside the disposable itself so that nothing can actually flow through. The problem is that if you're gonna do that, it's gonna have to be an uncoupled mechanism. And so it's very difficult to have a coupled mechanism if you're going to uh, have that type of a, uh, a seal there. So we designed ours a separate way. So if you actually look at the device, we, uh, we can go ahead and populate the, uh, the slide here. So if you actually look at the, 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 the actual mechanism, if you look at the device, I can take off the top here. So you can see that the top portion here is not sealed onto the bottom portion here. It was never intended to be. So this part here, uh, so if you poured liquid into the top here, because it's not sealed, if it's enough liquid, it's gonna get past these threads and actually flow out of the cartridge here, at this part here, not down here. So as you can see here in the schematic here is, is what I'm trying to um, uh, kind of explain to you is that you can see that the fluid, if it came through the device, which it's unlikely to do. So if you look at the bottom part here, the very bottom, you can see through the actual diagram here that we built in vents, just like most devices. They have vents, they have anti-suction cutouts that cause a scalloped edge. Um, these are all meant, so that, meant to be there so that they don't cause suction. So you're not physically sucking fluids into the device. Now, that being said, it is possible that when you turn the device over to change settings and such, that fluid could uh, you know, flow down towards the, the device because now you don't need suction, you have gravity pulling it down. Um, most times when you're doing treatments, you don't have copious amounts of fluid, but if you're using something like PRP or something like that, um, that might have more fluid than other types of treatments. So that being said, how do we know that if it's flowing through, it's not actually getting into the inner workings of the device? Well, 
first thing I would tell you is if you looked at what I just showed you with the bacterial contamination, we saw that not even one small bacteria was able to get through the device into the actual uh, pen. But we thought we would show you on a more macroscopic, more graphic uh, level how this actually works. So this next slide here is actually a video. So in a second, when I stop talking, you can go ahead and toggle to look at the video full screen if you're on a phone or, or on a computer. Um, and so uh, my uh, medical affairs and clinical group put this together where they actually used cow blood. Um, so if that helps you, it's not actual human blood, it's cow blood. And so they used copious amounts of cow blood and they actually poured it into the device. And I wanna show you uh, why exactly, even if it does get through this portion here, this top portion here, why that is not an issue. So, um, Angela, if you can go ahead and play. Okay, we're not hearing any sound, so let's start that over. And so while she's doing that, before she starts it again, um, I want to mention that this first video, um, we did not cut uh, because we wanted you to see that from start to finish, uh, that we did not mess with the pen, that it actually truly shows that if, if it ingresses through that top portion, it's not going to ingress into the actual device. And so the second video we cut because for time, for sake of time, we didn't want you to sit through a, you know, a 20 minute video. So this first video is about four and a half minutes and the second one's about two and a half minutes. So Angela, can you go ahead? To address the question regarding the potential backflow of fluids by the skin pen cartridge into the skin pen hand unit, we have made two demonstrational videos that we believe support the laboratory studies that were previously submitted, reviewed, and gained clearance for the skin pen by the US FDA. In the first demonstration, we will show that using cow's blood as an example of biological fluid, the skin pen cartridge is designed to limit the ingress of fluid into the hand unit drive shaft and cartridge coupler area, which we are referring to as the inner chamber. With a disposable one-time use cartridge being attached to the hand unit, the hand unit covered in the protective bio sheath provided with the cartridge kit, the unit is set up standing upright. Now again, this is essentially opposite to how the device would be used on a patient, but this is to exaggerate the exposure conditions seen in a clinical practice. As cow's blood is pipetted into the opening of the cartridge, we have added much more fluid than would ever be seen in actual operation. As you can see, it nearly fills the upper open chamber area of the cartridge. After a few moments, the blood is able to pass by through the outer plastic containing the depth adjustment threads and outward to the bio sheath covering the hand unit. Clearly, this is an excess of fluid, as well as the help of gravity to cause the flaw by the threads and out across the hand unit. Once the fluid has moved from the outer chamber, we are able to clean the hand unit bio sheath with a couple of sani cloths per the use instructions.
Once clean, we can remove the cartridge from the hand unit. When apart, it can easily be seen that even with an abundance of blood introduced into the upper opening, no blood reaches into the inner chamber area as both the drive shaft and cartridge coupler areas are free of blood, further demonstrated by using a cotton swab to show no movement of fluid into the connection area. So as you all can imagine, um, if you were to get blood on a cotton swab, it would be very visible. The vermilion would be very visible. So I think that that's an excellent demonstration to uh, corroborate what we saw with the microbiology experiment with the, that we did a couple of years ago with the FDA. Um, this next video is basically uh, answering the question, well, Thomas, you know, when you did that experiment, uh, mm -hmm. It was not operating, meaning the recipro reciprocating mechanism was not going on and off. And so what we did was we, uh, what I mentioned earlier, we did, we redid the microbiology experiments, but not with bacteria. We did it with red food dye so that we could actually see that if we're running the device for uh, 10 minutes straight upside down, whether there would be ingress into the device versus just through that the flow of the top portion of the device, as we saw just a few minutes ago. So uh, this next, uh, this is, not, I don't think this is it. So go to the next slide. Okay. And this one will be two and a half minutes. There will be some cuts. So uh, again, this was for sake of time. Uh, the, you know, so we'll uh, discuss it afterwards. Go ahead. In the second demonstration, we have created an exaggerated use experience using a plate that contains an artificial skin to which an abundance of red liquid, food colorant, has been placed. Placed on the tissue and liquid is kit pen lift, which is provided with the cartridge kit and acts as a glide in performing the microneedling procedure. The unit is turned on and microneedling of the tissue in the liquid is started. <clears throat> As you can see, there is considerable amount of liquid on the plate, an amount that would never be seen in real practice. The liquid fills the lower cartridge area entirely and even dissipates liquid through the cartridge tip vent holes. Remember, this is for an exaggerated demonstration regarding liquid exposure to the skin pen cartridge. After a few minutes of microneedling in the liquid, the skin pen is left running and tipped upside down, thus allowing any fluid in the lower cartridge area to remain in the cartridge. The unit is allowed to remain on. After 10 minutes of constant running, the unit is turned off and the cartridge and the hand unit are separated. Again, showing the inner hand unit drive shaft and cartridge coupler inner area is free of liquid. Further wiping with cotton swabs demonstrates no ingress of liquid into this inner chamber area. All right, so again, uh, I think that one of the takeaways from this is that, you know, from what I said from the very beginning of in this talk is just because somebody uses a moniker of microneedling does not mean that all devices uh, are the same. 
uh, that they don't work the same, that they're not designed the same. And one of the uh, one of the uh, case in points is this particular thing that our cartridges are definitely not the same on, as others on the market, as we've discussed today. Uh, the fluid ingress here, you cannot test ours the same as you would test another, simply because uh, of the way it's designed and engineered is that you have to do testing that is validated, that is standard, and that is in context of the device itself. And so uh, that being said, uh, we're running over time, so I'm gonna stop there, but we have a lot more to talk about that's very interesting on the handpiece next portion of this uh, webinar, which will happen, I'm not sure what date yet, but we're right now uh, getting uh, ready to do that one. Uh, I want to say thank you to Dr. Brian Jones and Dr. Mona Alcom, uh, who uh, did those videos for us. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have a, a few more videos and uh, show and tell experiments for you next time as well. So with that, I'm going to show you this last slide here that has uh, my um, contact info. So I have my uh, Instagram moniker on there. Uh, that I would say, please do uh, follow me because I'm gonna in the future have a lot more, not just on skin pen, but we have some very exciting microbiome technology coming out this year. And we're gonna have a webinar series coming out monthly from here till next year uh, that I would think you would very much like to watch. And so uh, go ahead and uh, follow me so you can see when those will be. Uh, if you have questions on today's uh, lecture, uh, send those to midinfo at crownaesthetics.com.